trees in the forest are no different than any other living thing. They start as tiny seedlings. They grow, mature, and die. Good forest management relies on techniques of cultivation similar to what you would use in the family garden. A forester will plant, weed, thin, and prune the woodland just as you would in the garden with carrots, peas, or beans. These practices improve upon the natural development of the crop and ensure healthy, vigorous growth. When managing the woodlot, the point in time at which we might use these techniques depends largely on the conditions we find there and on our personal objectives for the woodlot. Al Kimball is a forester with the Maine Forest Service, and his training in forestry and wildlife allows him to approach the application of these cultural practices in different ways. Al spent a day with us demonstrating these techniques on several sections of the Yankee woodlot. Al, what kind of objectives do landowners have? Well, there's all kinds of different things. A lot, most of the time, someone will say, I want to improve my land. That what do they mean by that? You, know, you don't know until you pin them down, because it can mean anything. They want to, usually, they just have read something about improving their woodlot, and they have a, an overall idea they want to make it better, but they don't know just what it is. And that makes it difficult when you, someone like me comes on the land, and they just say they want it improved. I have to know what for, more specific goal. Does the landowner have a lot of choices? Oh, sure. You can manage the land for wildlife or for timber, for firewood, to make it look better for aesthetics or for recreation. Trails to ski on and that. And you can blend all those different objectives together. So it is possible to do all those things? Right. But if you try and do all at once, you, you know, you're not going to maximize any one of them. Is it possible to do them all in one acre? you'd be pushing it quite a bit because the thing, especially when you talk about wildlife, because so many animals, their home range is so big. You can't, just can't squeeze a deer's home range into one acre, for instance. When you talk to a landowner, do many of them have their goals or objectives clearly defined? Very few of them do. Most of the time we have to work with them and help them see what it is they're really looking for. If he says, I want to improve the land, I'll go out, come back with, what do you mean by that? Do you want to have timber in the short run? Do you want to have firewood? You're interested in wildlife. If you're interested in wildlife, are you interested in having as many different kinds of animals on your land as possible? Or are you interested in having uh, one species in particular? And the, that makes a difference because you can, when you manage for one species, then you can, it's easier in a way because you've, you provide what that animal needs. If you're interested in all species, the best place to start is with a photograph or type map. And then if the land is pretty much all of one type of timber, you start breaking that up and making more different situations. Let's say that I want a variety of species, and we're going to start with that type map. What do we do? All right, the first thing you do is you look at it, and you see maybe it's got softwood over here and hardwood over here. It's pretty well mixed up already. Then what you would do is you'd start to look at it from the standpoint of how about once you get in those stands? Are those stands just one layer of vegetation at the top, or are there several layers? In other words, you can make your stands diverse both within and from the standpoint of having different types of, of timber. Let's say that timber management is the landowner's objective. How do you start? All right, again, you go right back to the beginning and look at the land and see what you have for soils and what you have for species. And then try to figure out how you can maximize the return on the effort you put in on the timber that you have to work with. What would you say is the most important advice that you can have for a landowner in establishing their own objectives? It's important that they be specific and give the person who's going to help them manage their land a specific goal to work on. And have someone that knows what they're doing that you can trust go over the land with you and help you determine whether or not your land will meet your objectives. What kind of assistance is there to set objectives? Well, you can get assistance from state foresters, private consulting foresters, or industry uh, foresters. And also limited assistance is available from the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. In terms of improvement, what kind of practices are we going to talk about? Well, we could go into a lot of terms at this, at this point. That's one thing that you run into a lot is foresters use terms, weeding, thinning, releasing, cleaning. I think what I'd rather do is we'll walk through this woodlot here and we'll discuss each situation. Basically, what we have is uh, some young softwood that's being overtopped by hardwood. And the question is whether or not to release that softwood by removing the overtopping hardwood. The other situation that we have down below is a sapling and pole size stand of hardwood where the trees are pretty much of a size. One isn't overtopping the other, but they're just too many of them. They're packed right in. We're going to talk about thinning that. Okay. So we're going to see releasing first, 
releasing and then thinning. Okay, if we see that, maybe we can help landowners uh, define some objectives after they've seen us do some releasing. I think so, because I'll try and bring in the different uh, objectives you might have in mind as you look at each of these situations, because you could handle them different ways depending on what your goals are. Why don't we uh, pick up our gear and go on and look at that first place? All right, that's probably the best thing to do. I can't get that over. This uh, forest is pretty thick here. Well, it wasn't supposed to be. This out here was a field that was planted at the right spacing, but it just keeps getting thicker because the aspen's seeding in from this what, pasture edge over here. So we're right on the edge of a pasture, and the spruce were planted here in these in these in this area, right here. Right. This this right here is a spruce that was set out. Okay. And then the aspen's been coming in and competing with it. Something that happens in Maine a lot. And the aspen's a lot taller. Right. It's shading down on that spruce, but you know you can see how tall it can get too. These aspen over here probably the ones that gave rise to the ones in the field. Pretty big aspen over there. Right. Of course, there's a benefit to those. In the wintertime, their buds provide the nutrition for partridge. So there's a, a wildlife benefit to those large aspen. But out here, they're competing with the trees that were set out. So how you handle depends on what your goals are. So we've got wildlife over there, and we got the possibility for some timber over here. Right. And you, you're not eliminating wildlife over here, because as the spruce comes up, it provide excellent hiding and escape cover for, for snowshoe hair. So if we want timber over here, what do we do? All right, you're going to start removing this aspen, because this aspen, all the way around, is shading out the spruce underneath. And it's holding back the growth. And it's about time to give the spruce a chance to really spurt ahead. Now, some of this aspen is dying. Why don't I just wait on it and let it die, and then it'll, the spruce will grow? Right, what it's dying from is a, a stem canker that chokes off the crown. You can see the roughness of the bark. There's been some woodpecker feeding secondary to it, but this roughness in the bark, and it gradually chokes off the trunk and kills the tree. But if you wait for that, all the time that that tree is dying, you're holding back the growth of the spruce that were planted here. And that would be a very, it wouldn't be a very intensive practice, and you're giving up growth all that time that your trees could be putting on height growth. If you look, some of these spruce in here are only three feet tall. So if I want to help this spruce for timber production, I better get rid of the aspen. Right, with only one thing that I'd consider as a possible drawback. Some of these trees have white pine weevil in them. I know they're spruce. That's that crooked top right, right. there. Right, and as we open the stand up, we may increase the amount of weevling because Norway spruce is a, is a host for that pest. So you call it white pine weevil, but it'll chew on a spruce tree right. too. Right, and then I've seen it on scotch pine and jack pine. Okay. So it, it affects many different things. What I'm gonna try is, if we thin this area quite heavily, release this spruce from the overtopping aspen, we may get some more weevling. But until we try it, we don't know how bad that's going to get. And what we can do is, if it's too heavy, maybe in the next part of the stand, we'll leave half of the aspen for partial shade. But right now, there's enough of it in here that's holding the spruce back. How long will we have to wait to find out where the spruce, uh, the mm -hmm. weevil's going to bother? It won't take very long. There's enough here. Show what I want to see is if the we'll... height growth is fast enough to get over the effect of the weevling fast enough. I'd like to get a butt log on these spruce as fast as possible. If, if you, timber is what you're after, sure. that's where the money is, it's in that butt log. So how are we going to do it? All right, well, we'll take, and we've got a small saw with us, and we can take and just remove a section here of the aspen, get it down. All you have to do is cut it off or girdle it or anything that eliminates it from competition. But I think something that'll help show up what we're doing here will be if I just tie some flagging on some of these trees that we're going to leave behind, the small softwoods, so they'll show up better. Would you normally do this? No, I'm just doing this so it'll show up better for the, illustrate what we're doing here. There, I think that'll give you an idea of what we have in mind. And when it's all done, you'll be able to see which trees have been released from the competition. You made quite a big change in here. Yeah, we opened it up quite a little. More sunlight hitting the ground? 
right. I think that now these trees will begin to fill out. They'll get fatter that much quicker and begin to reach for the sky in here. Now, these young softwood trees are, look like there's some space in between, uh, six, maybe 10 feet in some cases. Is that enough trees per acre? It looks oh, pretty yeah. open right now. Yeah, well, you'd like to have one more in here to keep the lower limbs smaller. Mm -hmm. But you don't really need it. They'll, they'll, as they grow, their branches will fill this space. And if you look in a mature forest, the trees are easy 15 to 20 feet apart if they're growing well. So well, all we've got here is that we don't have as much need for early thinning as we would have in another area. And right down in here, you've got a spot where the trees are just about right. And you've got a nice spruce coming along that should be able to head for the sky. No problem at all now. From a timber production standpoint, what should we be doing next? Wait. It's a mistake to enter a stand like this too soon now and start spreading these trees out. What you really want them to do is to capture the site themselves. They had one chance and they didn't make it. These aspen that we've cut are going to sprout back from the stump, too. Thinning isn't something you do just once. You may have to do it a couple times. The aspen may get ahead of these young softwood again? It may. But in these small ones, especially, ones like the one with the ribbon on there, that are five and six feet tall, probably will get the jump on the sprouts. How soon should I come back to look? You probably would check it every couple of years. And you're no. going to be, this plantation isn't done either, you know. There's a lot more work to do here. Like these trees that are leaning, they can be left, and the snow will weigh them down. But if they're going to be used, and if you're going to avoid bending over trees, those should be cut up like is in the, this area here. We, uh, we talked about looking at another stand. Let's go take a look at that. Al, this field's uh, grown up to uh, shrubs. You got any recommendations? Well, you can do a lot of things with an old field. You can see the shrubs that are coming up in it, and some pines and some alders even. It'd be quite a task to put it back into a crop field. But you know, the way this is right now, this is pretty good for wildlife. Is that right? Yeah, wildlife. How, how's it, uh, what kind of wildlife are we benefiting here? Well, of course, the deer come out here to feed on the grass, but the, this is a real good chance to talk about woodcock, if you want to think about that for a minute. You've got these individual bushes out in the opening. The first one's out into the field. The birds will, during their courtship flights in the spring, will settle by each of these, and each male will pick out a little territory during the breeding. Gotcha. Okay. And then the alders that are creeping in on the sides of the field, and there's quite a corner of them over here, those provide a good feeding habitat and during the fall migration. Now, you mean this, this big clump of alders right in there? Yeah, this, right, this is so good right now that if there's a flight of birds in in the fall and a migration, they use this for escape cover. And if, if there's a flight of birds around, there'll be birds here. <laughs> this will get you. I'll show you how we can manage for alder and woodcock on this other piece where they're going by. Yeah. You know, the last time I went through a place like this, there was a pretty good fishing hole at the other end. Well, no such luck here. All there is is woods on one side and a field on the other. These alders are getting thicker than the devil. Well, not really. What's thick is all the stuff from underneath, the old field plants. The alders themselves are dying out. They're breaking yeah. off and... Yeah, you know. they look pretty bad. Well, they're all... See how they're laying down? Okay. They're losing their vigor. They're just... No, no strength left to them at all. There's going to be an awful lot of fishermen happy about that. Nah. The trouble is that it makes it awful hard on the woodcock to probe in amongst all this vegetation. Yeah. Eh. See, it's kind of warm on. now, huh? Yeah. That's, I got an idea. Well, in order to show you what I do here to manage the alders for the woodcock, um, why don't we take and open this up. May as well get rid of these old ones and see if they'll sprout some more vigorous ones. Jeez, I know you're going to put me to work sooner or later. What kind of tools are we going to use? What's this one called? Well, that's a bush hook or bush axe, and it's a, it's a good one. It's heavy enough to cut down a good size alder, Yeah. but it, it's safer than a machete, which is the other one I've got. Where's the starting cord? Yeah, right, right here, but then I'd be the only one doing the work. Yeah, okay. So why don't you take from about here over, and what we'll do is we'll try and get all these alders down so new suckers will come up and hopefully be more vigorous at shading out the ground. I never thought I'd go out to grow it all over. Let's well, give it a try. Well, just think of it as cutting them. Just think of it as okay. cutting them. Okay. I don't want to drop one on you here no. now. No. Oh, that's okay. all right. You go ahead and, all right. and start. And... Here we go. Now, preferably, you'd be doing this during the winter when these were dormant, and then they'd sprout even better. So what have we accomplished here now? Well, basically what we did was we got rid of some alders that weren't doing well. They were passing out of the picture. And by cutting them down, their root systems that were supporting trees that were all that large and getting them to support the little suckers that are going to come up, it'll be about the, you know, the size of that branch. Those large root systems will make those grow really fast. And they'll come up, 
and they'll spread over and shade out all this undergrowth and make it a better place for the uh, woodcock to probe in. And the birds will collect and move through here on their way south, and they'll be looking for these alder coverts as, as places to, for escape cover and feeding cover anybody, and resting. Anybody would like to uh, favor woodcock, then, could do a little project like this in their alders and expect to see some benefit from That's it. right, especially where they're going by. And where they're laying down, that's the key. I'm surprised how fast we went along with these uh, hand tools. Right. It went pretty good. On the right size class, this the machete's good for real small stuff, but that yeah. tool there, even in the size classes we're working in, is almost as fast as a power saw. Now, these alders were what, 10 or 15 years old? Well, those in the field where these are probably a little older. Yeah. Now, you know, there's other species of wildlife that we can manage for in this piece of land. Sure. And there's a, an area over here that's got some oak and some aspen. And by, depending on how we work that, we can favor deer and partridge and... Let's not work too hard. It's getting kind of warm today. Well, I'll do this one. I'll oh, do this one. You're going to use the power saw. What else is here now? Well, what's going on here is that we've got a real nice oak tree right there beside you. And its crown is spread out against this aspen. This aspen isn't that vigorous a tree anyway. You see that it's trying to submerge these dead knots, but it isn't able to do it. It's not a vigorous tree. It's a good size for, to move out for fuel. And that'll give that oak just a little bit more room. So you say this is a premier tree right here? That's the best one so far. What do you like about that? Well. The objectives in this stand are to try and produce more oak mast, which is the acorns for, for wildlife, because deer and partridge and bear all use acorns. At the same time, try to produce some quality oak lumber on these trunks. Oak's longer lived species than the aspen that's overtopping in here. Oak is valuable for lumber and is valuable for wildlife both. Right. So you want to favor the oak. Right. And it's, a, it's sort of a key. It's not a typical tree for this area, but it does illustrate nicely the the competing for, for crown space that you get. So you want to make a great big opening here so it'll grow real fast. Well, yes and no. Oak is a tree that will put out new branches from the trunk. If you give it too much sunlight, there's buds in that bark that will grow new branches, and that will make the lumber of lower quality. So right here, I've got a big aspen on either side. I don't want to take them both out because that would give the trunk too much light, and especially that one's on the south side. So maybe what I think I'd like to do is take this Aspen right here. You're going to take that one. Right. Put some paint on it. All right. I'm marking the bottoms here just in case someone other than the landowner does it. The landowner will be able to tell that the right trees are cut because there'll okay. be paint on the bottom. All right. Now that tree lets that first oak have some room, but we've also got a small oak underneath of it right here. Yeah, a small one. You're going to try to bring that one along too. Right. Right now that tree's leaned over. We can't do much about that, but I'd like to get it to grow upward. In order to do that, I've got to give the crown some space on that side. So you're marking for space again, giving that tree more space. Right, crown space. A lot of times, people will ask, what, how far apart should I spread my trees? And that doesn't matter to me as much as spreading those crowns out and giving the tree room to grow. Now, why do you want a good crown? Well, that's the factory for the tree. That's what produces your lumber, and it's the food that actually feeds the production of the, the acorns that we're going to want in the future, too. So the leaves are the food factory. It's the key to the whole process. Right here again, we've got a small oak underneath of an aspen. So as you look out through there, we've got some aspen left. They aren't interfering with an oak. They're still producing those buds we talked about for the partridge. And they're storing fuel wood on the stump. Now, just as a reminder, bud, these were the paint on. These are the ones we're taking out. We've hung ribbons on the oak, the crop trees, and we're going to try and miss the trees I'm bringing down. Well, you got all the cutting done. Uh, what have you accomplished with this thinning, Al? You hear me with those? Sure, I can hear you. OK. Um, what, what do we got accomplished with this thinning now? All right. The main thing we're trying to do is release the crowns of these oaks to thin out the aspen away from them without giving too much sunlight to the bull. So this oak right here has got sunlight now on three sides, which is generally what I try to do in a, in a hardwood release. That, so you'd expect thinning. to get a, a bigger crown, more leaves, and, and maybe some acorn production, huh? Well, acorn production isn't the major objective as yet. I want the crown to fill out into the, to the sides and also to climb mm -hmm. and go upright. 
And eventually, this aspen over here will come off as well. So the next thing you do is cut this aspen over here on the left? Five years from now or so. Okay. As Al and I proceeded to clean up the aspen he'd harvested on this site, we discussed the importance of pruning to produce high-quality saw logs. Pruning is the process of removing the limbs from the trunks of selected trees. As the pruned tree grows, the branch stub is overgrown and more valuable knot-free lumber is produced. Here you see some boards which were sawn from two different trees, one which was pruned and one which was not. We laid the boards out on the ground in the order in which they were sawn from the trunk. If you look closely at the top boards, you'll notice that they contain many knots. Knots like these tend to make the lumber weaker and less valuable in the market. These boards contain large areas of clear lumber and are stronger and more useful. They are also worth five to six times more in the marketplace. Needless to say, pruning is one cultural practice which can produce a significant increase in the value of a tree, well worth serious consideration by the landowner wishing to grow trees to sell for lumber. Al Kimball took me to another corner of the woodlot and demonstrated just how simple a process pruning really is. Why don't we start with this one out here in front and work our way on back. All right. Take a look at this now. OK, this is a little larger tree. Now, this is getting up to being almost too large to do right. it. And that, that depends almost more on the landowner than anything else, how long he can stand to hold that investment on the ground. Now, this is white pine. Right. Everything in here we're going to prune is white pine? Well, we could prune some spruce. OK. Um, there's some market for, for clear spruce, for clabbered stock, and for uh, plywood veneers. Do we ever prune anything else other than spruce or pine? It's not too common. So if a person wanted to do it to make it look nice, he could. But for lumber production, right. you're really talking about pine or maybe spruce. Right. A lot of people find that pruning makes their stand look better for them. And usually you'd start off, either, if you had a telescoping pole, you would have it all the way collapsed. Mm -hmm. for these wooden poles, we'll start with a short saw. This is called a Malin saw. And I like to use either goggles or a face shield because of all the dust and the branches, of course, will fall down on you. Anything special about that saw? How could, could I use just a hand saw? Or? You could. It's got a hooked blade on it so that the, the weight of the saw and of my stroke, see, holds it on the branch. And you'll see the advantage of that when we get up higher. Yeah. Now, that little hook on the back side, that's so you can hang it up someplace? That's for lunch hour. Lunch hour. OK, good idea. That's, <laughs> I hope it comes pretty soon. OK, now you'll notice that I'm moving around the tree, right? Yeah. Now, if you don't, let me just do one. If I get lazy and don't go around the tree, Now, that one broke. Yeah. But let's say I didn't go around the tree on this one, see? I oh, leave you, a stub. Yeah, you leave a stub hanging out. And okay. that could take five or 10 years for that to heal over. So you want to kind of do it in close, but not break the bark, huh? Right. Even on white pine, even just a little scuffing there is all right. You don't want big saw tracks down the trunk. Now, are we going to hurt the wildlife in here with the pruning because they don't have any place to land and perch and all that stuff? OK. Like I said, we're only going to prune between 80 or 120, 150 trees to the acre. That's going to leave plenty of trees in here that aren't pruned. Um, where you really begin to have an impact on wildlife is if you prune every single tree in a stand that has live crowns all the way to the ground. In a stand like this, most of the lower limbs had died out naturally. Mm -hmm. Trees sure. do that as the shade kills the lower branches. And Pruning it, all the trees would eliminate all those branches. You're right. And that makes it less diverse and eliminates some of the elements in the habitat. Now, to get up higher, we're going to need a step ladder. Either that or I've got to grow or use a longer pole. OK. I, I bet you we got one of those right here. Yeah. I stopped growing long enough ago. To... Let's see if we can figure out this. Well, let's just use the bottom okay. half first. Right. That's easier than juggling right. the whole length. So you got a four-foot pole and an eight-foot pole. Well, that's about a, with that one, you can get up about nine feet. Nine feet. That's called a Malin pruning saw. How, how high are we going to go here? Well, you've got to think about it. I mean, pruning is a, it's, it's a good investment. The studies that have been done show that you can realize about 20% on the money it costs you to do this. You may want to step back. These will sail a little bit. Yeah, all right. I'll uh, watch what's going on here. And uh, but now you, that clear lumber is worth four or five times as much, I imagine, when I go to the lumber yard. So yeah, that's you, why the, the, it's going to pay off when you do this. OK, a couple things on that. First of all, because you're pruning for a commercial market, you want to make sure that you prune to a height that's a, a board that you make can be sold. All so right. you want to go in even multiples, I see. 8 feet, 10 feet, 
12 feet, 14 feet, 16 feet. And I'd like to take this tree up as high as I can reach because it's, it's a pretty good tree all the way up. How am I going to uh, convince that sawmill man that this is clear lumber? 20 years from now, when I cut that tree, or my children cut this tree, uh, the sawmill man, he doesn't know whether there's any clear lumber in there or not. How am I going to get my money out of it? That's right. Right now, you've got to prove it to him. There isn't that much pruned wood on the market. The mills aren't used that used to buying it. The best thing is to put it, register it right with your deed. How many trees were pruned to how high and how long ago? You mean write out a piece of paper and take it to the, actually to the right. courthouse and put it in the register? And better yet, I, if, if you can, I'd have it certified by a for, registered forester. Or somebody certify what you did and how you did it. Right. How much? Huh. Because otherwise, like you said, when you take it to the sawmill, that sawmill owner, it's only worth that much more to him if he knows for a fact it's been pruned. I hope you realize one important concept from this program. No matter what your objectives are for your woodlot, they can be enhanced by the careful application of some basic forest cultural techniques. All it takes is planning, time, and work. That's it for this program. I'm Bud Blumenstock. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time in the Yankee Woodlot. Woodlot was produced by the main public broadcasting network, which is solely responsible for its content. And was made possible in part by a grant from International Paper Company.